We can't hear you. Ah. Very good. Now we okay, can. Okay, now hear. can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hello. This Galaxy tablet. That's right. Can you hear us? I hear their voices now. Well. Okay. I I was able to unmute, and I can hear you loud and clear, Marianne. Likewise. Okay. For some reason, I can't see you, but that's okay. Just keep talking. Hi. <laughs> I, wave. I got two, two uh, versions of me. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> You'll see one, Marianne. Yeah. Let's see. Have so, anybody have any questions or responses to what I said? Oh, I do. <laughs> okay. I always wondered how we got from the Puritan religion to the religion that I was a member of as a Baptist. I always thought, you know, how in the world did that happen? And I think you have a present a very reasonable theory for how that happened. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody, everybody came. There was a place at which that sinner in the ha in the hands of the angry God version didn't appeal to people anymore <laughs> and, and, and Europeans went to secularism um, and then but we didn't and so that's my I, that was the, the thing I could find that made that change and and there's there's lots of ways I just did God because it's only one thing in a service but there's lots of ways in which our religious ideas are more African than the, than the European colonists brought with them yeah. So, so, not us, not the Euro, not the Unitarians. We weren't part of that process, but the uh, the evangelicals and, and the later Protestant churches have that. Mm -hmm. We we weren't we weren't part of it, but many of us as individuals chose that wing of whatever Christian faith we came from that was more positive and hopeful and uh, loved it. Yeah, the, the Unitarians at the time of the Second Great Awakening, they thought that was all crap. <laughs> they were they were intellectuals. They didn't like that singing and clapping and dancing and rolling on the floor. They didn't like any of that. So our European, our, our Unitarian heritage doesn't really go through that. But for all of us who were something else and raised in some other tradition, yeah, our heritage and our American cultural ideas, even if you don't believe in God, you think he's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not, and that was not the Puritan idea. I would like to, uh, I'm thinking of my father's um, people all came to the New York City area afterwards. And um, oh, I'm, I was fascinated by your theory. I, I see a lot of uh, truth. You know, it's like, wow, how come I didn't think of that uh, <laughs> way back when? But I think for the people that um, came later, they may not have been influenced that way. It was, they were Catholic, French, German, uh, or not. My father was uh, were Irish, Italian, and, and French, um, all Catholic, and uh, they saw pretty well fell away. Um, and I grew up in a, a colonial town settled by the Dutch, and they hadn't really changed that much, you know, right outside New York City uh, from, you know, the late 1600s. So I don't, I think there are parts of the country, I, I want to ask, do you think <laughs> there are parts of the country where that influence was stronger? Because I didn't think, I don't think there was much in the New York metropolitan area the the, uh, the the second great awakening which i think is when these people got together uh was mostly in the middle and southern states not as much in the north the northeast and we're talking about pre-civil war yeah. is when when the, the the and then uh and then all those people went west <clears throat> And so they carried those ideas with them west. And there is there is evidence of some influence further north, but the, the biggest changes happened in uh, the the middle country states and the southern states. 
Yeah. That's where the Great Awakenings were hot. It was hot. Although New York had a lot of those revivals too. There's a part in New York that's called the burned over area because they had time after time after time, different religious explosions. Uh, so it's not exclusively South. Yeah. But maybe not New York City as much as, as the more um, rural parts of New York. Yeah. Well, how did the... Over here, and I have a question for Marianne. Um, when, when you first said the first grade of awakening, I heard first grade like G-R-A-D-E. So <laughs> it took me a minute. But anyway, could you explain for me what the first great great awakening and second great awakening? The first and second great awakening were, uh, and I'll have to, I, I have to admit that I didn't go back and do all and review all that research before I came, uh, were uh, uh, revivalist mo movements. The first was a uh, smaller version. And then um, the second came a little bit later and was a bigger. More, not more or less. Yeah. Um, Pre-Civil War, so um, early 1800s. The second was, I think, 18 is like 1830. The first was like 20 years earlier. I, I'm guessing at the dates because I, I don't remember numbers that well. But who gave it the name, the Great Awakening? It was uh, because it was a, a revival of uh, awakening of the spirit. So they saw that as the Holy Spirit coming and reviving Christianity. And uh, so they call it, so I, they call it, first they said the Great Awakening and then the second time they had to call it, just like the, the first world war was only called the great war. And then when we had a second great war, we had to give it another name. So they, and, and so that's, that's the scholars know that more. But Unitarians came up and Universalists came up with the idea of universal salvation, you know, which is what, what, uh, was that independent of the South, do you think? It, it, um, I'm not as sure about the Unitarian history, but yeah, I mean, at the, at the time of the First Great Awakening, people were not liking the Calvinistic view that only some people were saved and there's little or nothing you could do about it. Um, and so our Universalists, actually our Universalists who are really the, universal salvation part of you use uh, are uh, later after the civil war and they're the colonists that settled what we now call middle America they called the far west um, <laughs> and so they were probably influenced by these uh, revivals as well uh, the Unitarian part is uh, were more uh, in the northeast mm -hmm. uh, the you know the New York New Jersey, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. whole northeast area, um, and they had different. They had they had stronger ideas about God um, uh, as a as a single being. The Unitarian, the Universalists were more of this. Every you know, why not every man uh, mm -hmm. was there, was was part of there, and they and they probably got some of it from these revivals as well, <laughs> or from the you know subsequent to the revivals. Because it's not in, it's not in European theology. Still, you know, in theology, was it, some Catholicism, which did have a way of getting of becoming saved. But when when Europe went to Protestantism to Calvinism, um, that was predestination, hot shit mm -hmm. predestination. Uh, <laughs> and, and I don't. And I don't understand why you would be a good person in that system because there's nothing, being a good person doesn't give you any. Uh, well, I've been to uh, Protestant churches who, who do not believe in that. The Presbyterians were identified as the ones who believed in predestination, but some of the others that I attended <laughs> with, you know, friends and so forth throughout the years. So. Yeah, the, the, the more... Uh, the later 
Protestant churches, the Baptists and the Methodists, uh, they didn't do the predestination, but they're later additions. To they did. It. Oh, okay. Fascinating. It really so is. Calvin, you know, Calvin uh, was one of the first uh, for the, for the, um, in the Protestant Reformation, one of the first <laughs> thinkers. But Martin Luther and Calvin were the two big, big, and there's a couple others, big thinkers that were the originators of the uh, Protestant Reformation. And Calvin came up with, I mean, Calvin read the Bible and said, the Bible says we have predestination. Mm. Wow. So Joe <laughs> was waving your hand. Oh, I was waving at your husband. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> the way, he yeah. He's heard this story before. <laughs> I thought Fred was going to say something. <laughs> what, uh, Fred, you want to say something? No. Peter. Right. Yeah, I'm curious about how, out of what you have just said, I, I have the term Bible Belt ringing through my head, and I've always associated Bible Belt with the geographical territory below the Mason-Dixon line, and that it was directly linked to the practice of enslavement of, of dark-skinned people. Um, it wasn't linked to, to slavery, but it was slave areas. And, it, and that's where these revivals were. It's linked to the revivals, to the Great Awakening revivals. Okay, and which did include people of color or it was revivals for white only? No, the original, the earliest revivals were, were basically egalitarian. They worshiped together and there are actually hist historical records of early, churches that were founded that had integrated congregations and had lead black leaders uh, it didn't last very long but but there were uh, there were integrated churches in the american south uh after the second great awakening okay so and 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 my theory is that's that's where white americans learned this african these African ideas was in churches where there were African Americans worshiping with them, and where there were African Americans. I said it orders. Those it's a, that's a particular leadership role in these early churches. So they had ministers and exhorters and teachers who were black. Right. Exhorters is that the word? Exhorters. They exhorted people. <laughs> right. I like that. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what they did, but they were they were leaders in the church. <laughs> Well, how then did we develop into the situation now where we have white Christianity, which appears to be quite oppressive of non-white Christianity? How, how did that happen? Well, after, after the Civil War, then there were no longer integrated churches. And so Blacks established their own churches. Uh -huh. okay. And that's, if, if, you read, if you read almost any history of Christianity, they don't even start talking about black Christianity until the foundation of the of the black churches. And, and I say that they, it came earlier than that. But the very earliest, the very earliest um, uh, uh, colonists or and Americans uh, didn't didn't want to uh, convert their slaves because. They might have to. They first they thought they might have to free them, and then they thought they would be uppity. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, being smart, they would take over. Yeah. Well, so and and that gave them that that gave them an opening to continue their own African practices, and have them available for when they were integrated later on. Yeah. But I think there's a whole lot of evangelicals who would be freaked out to learn that they are the African-based religion of North America. <laughs> Hi, Judy. Welcome. Hi. I didn't know I would get on your meeting. I love uh -huh. you. Well, there's only a couple people, so I can see everybody. That's good. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm here twice because I'm not real sure if, where you're getting your information. So. Uh -huh. I didn't understand what you just said. 
That's okay. You don't need to. <laughs> well, I enjoyed your presentation this morning and be reminded of that history. Thank you. I could do, I, I, when I did this morning, many years ago, I did a thing on the Congolese Christianity, which is which happened in 1491. So before the Americas were a twinkle in anybody's eye, uh, Congo became Christian. Oh. I've, I've got another sermon about Congolese Christianity, uh -huh. which would be fun to do. We've got enough new people that can do it again. Uh huh. So, I, was gonna, I was gonna tell Suki that, but she's busy. Uh -huh. And that was. Oh, yeah, when you write a book, you can find a whole bunch of stuff in there to do sermons on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Some other, some of you haven't said anything. Our relationship with voodoo. Voodoo is. Um, uh, most of the people who came to North America came from Congo, which is West Central Africa. Uh, voodoo is most, there was some Congolese. Uh, voodoo um, was created in Haiti, and, and it's a, it was a mix of Congolese and West African uh, Yoruba Dahomey people. Uh -huh. so it's, it's, and Christianity. But, those, but keep in mind, those Congolese people that came to Haiti, they didn't learn about Christianity in Haiti. They already knew. They had 200 years. 200 years. That's as old as the United States. 200 years of history to think about what Christianity meant to themselves. Oh. So voodoo is a different tradition. It's the African-based tradition of Haiti. It's all about the spiritualist practice. Jerry had her hand up. Oh, let me talk to you later. Okay. Somebody else. Somebody? Oh, I was just going to say that growing up in Texas as a child, I found it to be very severe and very Puritan. But I think it's relevant to say that we were severely segregated. You know, we, we just didn't have Black influence at all. I mean, they were around, but we didn't mix a bit. Yeah. And that's that's the post-Civil War, you know, in, in the pre-Civil War. And and. Texas is, a, is mostly post-Civil War. So, but you carry, I think, we could look at the theology of where you were and some of these ideas carried forward as an Amer as a white idea. Uh -huh. So most white Protestants don't think of these ideas. The thought of God is our friend. They don't see that as an African idea, but it is. Uh -huh. I agree that in Jesus. So we, we've forgotten the history. Jesus yeah. is my friend, my best friend. Yes. So the expressiveness, the clapping and the standing up and the demonstration of an emotional transformation that you think was more from the African roots than from the, I mean, and and yeah, yeah. Oh, we were Methodist, but then we went to the tent meetings like a spectacle almost. And many Sunday nights, we went to what we call the Holy Rollers. And as a kid, they were much more interesting than our. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot more. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the Methodists, the early, early Methodists, uh, thought that you should have one of those experiences. And if you, if you had one that was good enough, oh, oh. And, and most white people had the one, and then they didn't they didn't get slain in the spirit and possessed or whatever whatever that was. Uh, but the Africans that were part of that, because that was their that's how they did religion in Africa it was possession trance. Hmm. And if you and if you I mean when I saw when I first saw. African-based possession trance in Santeria, and then I saw went to a, a real evangelical Protestant church, and went, oh yeah, <laughs> they're, 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 uh, you can see that you can see how the two things are similar. And, and do you think Unitarianism is 
trying to recapture some of the, you know, more call and response, more uh, uh, standing up and clapping? Are we are we trying to re-embrace some of that side of the human spirit? Or yeah, because at, at this at the time of the Second Great Awakening, the Unitarians, the Universalists, were just getting started, or maybe not even started yet. The Unitarians did not participate in that. They were too they were too rich. They were too intellectual. They were too rational, and they thought that was all bull hockey. Okay. <laughs> and so we have never, I, as Unitarians, we've never really had that as part of our history. And now we, we want to integrate that into our history, but we're having to add it. And oh God, I'm out of here. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but as we talk about it's being inclusive, we had to do some self-examination about that we look pretty damn dull sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we carry the pretty damn dull step forward. Somebody, somebody's got to have it, and we got it. Oh, no, we're really going that way? Yes, it no. is true. But we're going, we're, we're going more towards um, bringing in more African and African-American-based ideas. That's fine. They come to us. You know, like when you can notice how many have come, very few. Yeah, well, and they come when they want to. Uh, feel depressed and so we're trying to make openings for them that's kind of the thing i have to like it lots of people don't but that's that's where the church well, is if going. i were younger and this happened i would be i would not be part of anything like evangelistic we're not not evangelistic but more expressive more expressive liturgy and more more welcoming of african-americans and their culture but don't insult don't insult African Americans by thinking that they're all uneducated and can't keep up with that. our I'm professors. No, I'm not saying that at all. And I think there are plenty of black people that could, and I we had a black minister in in Redwood City, and there were, you know, so the, uh, the the black Unitarians feel like they are not as welcome as they could be. And the unit UUA are trying to make the denomination as a whole more welcoming. But, but can't we be welcoming without becoming something else? Change the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. That's the Dallas thing. That's true. That's so true. We are we are in a period of change. <laughs> okay. All righty. I think Suki came back like maybe she wants to close no. down this computer. No, I'm just oh, okay. But everybody else has left. So I'm unless somebody's got burning questions, I'm gonna shut it down. Great. Last chance for okay. burning questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Maria. Thank, you, Maria. Thank you. It was fascinating. Yes. Really. <laughs> and and she's been standing, even after standing giving the sermon, she's been standing all this time answering your questions because we didn't know how to move the computer off the pulpit. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's okay, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe.